Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm not a doctor, Ken Hamilton. <laughs> you are. You're still not a doctor. Still not a doctor. Um, I think that today's topic is super interesting, but I think it starts off sounding really boring. But it is very interesting. Okay, we're going to talk about relationship agreements again. And before you click through saying, <laughs> we already talked about this. I want to take this conversation to the next level because I work with people creating relationship agreements all the time. And in fact, we are all creating relationship agreements all the time, but we don't talk about it. Right. And this makes them this slippery, messy thing that can really make or break not just the relationship, but our happiness, yeah. our, our, our ability to enjoy a relationship. Yep. So this is going to take things to the next level. We talked about relationship agreements as, as a starting point. And what I just said to you before we hopped on is, for me, relationship agreements are really always, they, they boil down to one thing. Mm. They were an agreement to be in a conversation about yeah. how this relationship goes, what I need, what you need, right. what we're doing. It could it's be. an agreement to have a conversation. Right. And it can look like an agreement to do things a particular way. Like, so here's the list and you hold up the list and you, and you show your partner and say, these are the things we're going to do. And if you don't do them, I don't know, stuff happens. But, but in fact, what it is, is so this is a, a shared picture we have. Let's keep talking about it as it evolves. Right. And so there's the thing. I think that <laughs> when we make an agreement, there is, at least in the culture we share, um, there's a desire, an unspoken desire to have the agreement begin to be the thing that holds our relationship up. Yeah. And that to me is a very um, fixed mindset, very legalistic sort of feel. Right. As if we could assign power to this document mm -hmm. that now will exist and will be the judge and jury for us when and, something happens. And we're going to let the document take responsibility for whatever happens next. For our feelings. For our feelings. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we've, how do we know this? Because we've done it really badly. Mm -hmm. Yay. Yep. Um, yeah. We, we had some early relationship agreements that were they were thorough in their way yeah. they addressed. So I like to think of relationship agreements as built of these different blocks. You've got, you've got different aspects of your life, like the financial aspect and the time aspect and the sexuality aspect and the parenting aspect and the home taking home caretaking aspect and all sorts of things. You've got all these blocks and you can build an agreement out of them, but <laughs> it is really, really tempting to build an agreement and forget that we are changing. Yes, right. Independently. It and and so when I am building my agreement, um, the the formality of that agreement can start to flatten and and make it seem like there's such a thing as security and safety forever and ever. Right. Um, and even even the language I used in here in this podcast saying as the agreement evolves. The agreement doesn't evolve. We evolve. Yeah. And then we have a conversation about what that means. And then we write it down. So we kind of capture that point in time of what, what was going on for us. And so, yeah, what you were saying about security, uh, uh, security t for what? Security so that neither of us ever change? It's not right. what we're looking for. It's not what you and I have agreed to do. You and I have agreed to grow. We've agreed to prioritize growth over comfort, which is by definition at times uncomfortable. uncomfortable. And when I'm working with clients on the agreement, often this is during a time of change. Like the reason they got to the spot where they're ready to create an agreement is somebody has said, hey, you know what? I can't live with how things are. So 
let's give a, a for example. Frequently what happens is somebody has been in a relationship for a while, for a period of time, it might be weeks or months, or many times it's years or decades, and they've been working on an implicit agreement. They've been right. they've yeah. been existing in their relationship using a sort of cobbled together unspoken set of rules that guide them as I, to what is normal and what is expected and what is what is allowed. I have absolutely been there, done that. Yeah, and you did it in your first marriage. Mm -hmm. I did too, even though I was trying to be explicit all the time. That is, and I've done it with you. There oh, are oh, yeah. all these things that we let slip into the, the edges of our communication yeah. and we forget to make explicit. But moving from that implicit, especially, I mean, you experienced it. You had a an, an incredibly implicit. We weren't even trying to be explicit. That wasn't yeah, the goal. The goal was implicit. Why? Yeah. Because we didn't want to talk about the the stuff. And why? Because it was uncomfortable. And why? Because we didn't want to change. And why? I'm not sure. I think at the What's root of this, not just you, but all of us, really starting to make things explicit makes us face oh okay yes <laughs> it makes us face you. something really tender something that nobody wants to talk about which is that inevitably we are all walking ourselves home yeah inevitably we are all going i mean i feel like i need to sing a jackson brown song here like we're we are here yeah. interacting with each other for a time and then we will die I don't know another way to say that, but yeah. in order to evade that reality, but facing it, facing the reality that we will all have many things to grieve and we will all eventually no longer exist. Yeah, that's a good reason to just be like, you know what? Let's not talk about, about who takes out the trash because talk about that. that's just going to pull at a thread I don't want to unravel. Yeah. See, we told you this would get more fun. Yeah. It's <laughs> Okay. But it, but it, well, the thing is that that mortal dread, um, it can work in two directions. It can work to inspire, like it did me, inspire me to um, not look at anything because in order to look at it, I have to look at the mortal dread or something I learned from you. You can look at the mortal dread and have it inspire you to use your time right now so we grew up with the people around you and appreciate it and develop. And, and that's what we do. Yeah. We grew up with very different sort of modes around this. So my parents, um, both of them expected to die young. And so I grew up thinking that the timeline for my life would be fairly short. Right. Um, it was just normalized in my household that like fifties or sixties is as long as you can expect to get. And so I did use that as motivation mm -hmm. to go and do and not just achieve, but like go experience things. Yeah. You grew up, oddly enough, even though your parents didn't live very long, you grew right. up with a more typical expectation that yeah. anything's possible and there'll always be time. And there will, yep. And so when you and I started spending our romantic time together, you were 43 and I was 33. And we were in very different places. I was like, okay, I'm in love. Let's do this because we might have no time left. Right. And you were like, I mean, that's the rush. I, I, it's Fine. Light. Yeah, I've got all the time in the world. Yep. And that was one of our first implicit, explicit transitions to make. Yeah. And it sounds really like murky. Like, what? We needed to talk about like the nature of time and death drive and. Well. We do. Yeah. But <laughs> we do talk about that stuff. We do. But it also was the beginning of us talking about what mattered to us. Oh, values. Values. So mm -hmm. your relationship agreement is going to be different. Everybody's is going to be different. And that's why I say it's like talking about these blocks of things that you want to cover. It's not that you're trying to make an agreement that covers every possible thing that could happen. In fact, that's it. That's not possible. You're trying to make an agreement that lets you understand and and feel seen. So you want to be able to see your partner and be seen. Right. Being seen is being loved in my book. Um, and so when I try to make myself known to you by saying, hey, can we agree, for instance, that um, that Sunday mornings we will always turn to each other and that like that's our time together and we won't text anyone else and we'll be together 
something in me wants to be known. Right. right? Some part yeah. of me wants to be seen. Seen. And by, <laughs> by agreeing to that, I am, I'm validating and appreciating that thing that you're showing me, that right. part of you. But it's tempting and people get a little locked up here to imagine that that agreement to Sunday mornings being like text free and interruption free, that, that the point is that when the point is really the value behind it. Right. So this took us years to figure out, um, through trial and error that the, that it wasn't the rule that was helping us. It wasn't the written down rule. It was the meaning behind the rule. Yeah. So that, uh, that's really interesting. You, you started this off by saying that, yeah, it's about agreeing to be in a conversation. And the last time that we sat together and wrote down an agreement. Yeah. Beginning um, of this summer, we did a, yeah. a big refresh. And yeah. uh, uh, we did. And we had the conversation and we talked about a bunch of stuff and have not looked at it since. Yeah. Yep. You know, because that was the process. That was the thing we were doing was we were coming together and reviewing our own values and how they interact with the, the others. And, um, and yeah, we have a so, process yeah, that we go through where there is a, a separate us. I mean, the, I yes. believe that the best agreements come from first going deep with yourself. If, if all of your attention is pointed outwards and attempting to make an agreement that is defined primarily by how will you treat me? I need you to treat me in X, Y, and Z way. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, right. It's a really disempowering feeling. Yeah. Um, and also I probably am not at the root of what it is I actually want. So using the example I just used, um, Sunday mornings, it's not about Sunday morning for me. It's not, and it's not about the needing to have that time be time when we turn toward each other is not about Sunday. It's not about a certain set of hours. It's not about um, any sort of sacred connection to Sunday. It's, so what's it about for you? It's about having one day a week where I let myself totally sink into being present for us. It's not actually about what you do. It's a, pro right. it's a promise I'm making to myself right. to show up and be in this relationship. So it'd be tempting to to point my finger at you and say, hey, don't pick up your phone or, hey, we're not supposed to do that or whatever. But really, I just need to keep coming back to what is it I want to create here? And so you're... What I, want? I want a period of time when I feel really fully present with you, despite all the other things that could pull, of our, pull our attention. And it starts with me. It starts with you. And so the agreement written down and physically present in the world or digitally present, however you do it, um, let's it gives you a way of being accountable to yourself. Yeah. Not It's not about whether you holding me accountable, although, see, and here's the thing. I will ask you for help in things that I think I might struggle with. And if I've asked you, again, explicitly, then then when the time comes, it's like, yeah, I, I, I know I forget about that sometimes. Would you remind me if you see me do it? But again, that's me asking you to help me be accountable to myself. I'm not asking you to make me do what's in the agreement. Right. So people talk about agreements and accountability. And often I find, especially clients who are just starting to make their conversation explicit, they've moved out of implicit and they're starting to make their relationship be based on explicit communications. Mm -hmm. There is a desire to have accountability be, again, about pointing the finger outwards and I'll hold you accountable. And even you hold me accountable and you've been a great lesson for me because you have loved for me to hold you accountable. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, in, in a, in the middle part of our relationship, we were living a 24 seven dynamic of power exchange right. where I was holding you accountable mm -hmm. in a very clear. And if you're not familiar with these terms in a, in a kink power dynamic that we had explicitly designed where I was in charge of of holding you accountable. Yeah. We had done, we had made this arrangement. We can go, we can go all whole, into that. There's a whole, whole other there, conversation to have there. But sticking on this conversation but for now. What I found is it was, um, we did that for several years. And while there were fun parts of it, I liked the sexy parts of it. It lacked true relational quality for me in some really yeah. key ways. Yeah. It doesn't for everyone. You know, each person is, is unique, but 
And for it might me, not have for someone other than me. Like the right. dynamics are for me really variable. It wasn't actually as sexy or as um, relationally juicy to hold you accountable. Later, we transitioned into a different sort of um, agreement and an accountability agreement where you started having to hold yourself accountable. And that's when things really shifted. Yeah. Oh, when yeah. you started making our relationship about holding yourself accountable, I think that's the inflection point. That's the, that's the moment where I'm like, ooh, everything really leveled up. Everything changed. I'm certain that I also started holding myself accountable, but that was a brilliant moment. That was good. I, you know, I it don't think I have life, seen it, it so clearly as you're running, putting it right now. Everything. Well, and I know one of the reasons that it uh, it changed. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of good ones, but something that's coming up for me is um, so if I let ask require you to hold me accountable then i get to feel resentful of you right. right when you are holding me accountable for something that um so on the one hand it might be something that i i kind of believe in but don't feel real good about doing mm -hmm. and you hold me to it so i do it and then i'm like okay i'll do this thing and be mad at you for making me That's do like the thing that i the, asked you to make all the me people do. who were wonderful i love my crossfit tra trainees but the people who wanted to be mad at me for making them yep. do yep. some work particular workout and so by by taking <laughs> the accountability on myself well, I was the only one I had to be resentful about. And boy, did that help our relationship. You grew up. I grew up. I stopped. It, it yeah. was a transition out of an adolescent form yeah. of oh, like a very yes. high school mo mode into, yeah. oh, actually, I'm I'm upholding my agreements because I want to be in integrity with myself. Mm -hmm. And that was, I mean, so you would have been probably 48 49 when that started to change it is never too late it's never too to late. decide to make that transition i really believe that and that wasn't just you because that also empowered me to right. start saying wait, wait wait while i've always been good at holding the bar really high for myself there have been things that i have have put on you yeah. and 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 left in this this space of implicit like blah and yeah it's about being able to externalize my anger and be mad at you for yep. holding me accountable. Yeah. And that is not the way I see forward for a society that actually wants to move into a more peaceful, yeah, um, right. equitable, just place mm -hmm. because self accountability is, is well, it's all, it's a lot classier. It's a lot classier. <laughs> it really it's is. A, it's, and it's, um, it's so much more mature and it's hard. It is and, hard. And it you have to face your own entitlement. Ooh, I remember yeah. that being a big thing. That we must have had day-to-day -day conversations about all the things that were hiding in your entitlement. Yep. yep. Lots and lots and lots and lots of things that weren't just keeping me from being who I wanted to be, but were actively in the way of our relationship being good in the moment and growing. Yeah. Well, when we talk about relationship agreements, another thing that comes up for clients is it's, it's possible to weaponize an agreement. Oh, and this yeah. is where I know, I know other coaches and counselors who choose not to do formal agreements because they've seen them weaponized so often, especially mm -hmm. people who are negotiating um, consensual non-monogamy, things like that. They'll be like, ah, but when we make a set of rules, the rules now become this thing that can be broken and can cause hurt. I tend to err on the side of needing to call that out and now make that part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Because I think that to, to say that we don't need an agreement because it can be weaponized, actually, it, it doesn't matter because you can also weaponize not having an agreement. Um, that's about yeah, right. mood. That's about deciding, yeah. committing to the truth of, of an agreement, of any agreement. If in fact, we are each accountable to ourselves, if we live in a society, in a culture, in a, in a family where we value autonomy and independence while also honoring what we owe each other and what we, yep. what we have committed yep. to each other, then we have to get comfortable with the fact that we're going to grow and change so that the conversation about the agreement is 
is not going to be about finger pointing in, and instead is going to be about, okay, we wrote this down. We said that let's use a really easy one. Um, I said, I would handle all the homeschooling, right? I said that. And then I went to grad school and I couldn't handle it all by myself. Right. Oh, things changed. Things changed. If you had said, hey, but it says you'd hold all the, you'd do all the homeschooling. That wouldn't have felt very good. But also if I had said, well, the agreement says I have to, so I have to, that doesn't feel very good. So instead it was a conversation about the fact that our priorities had changed or more specifically in this case, my priorities changed. Yep. I went to grad so school and I needed help if I was going to make grad school work and homeschooling still work. And I had to say the uncomfortable thing about yeah, so I need to renegotiate this. Yep. This doesn't work for me anymore. I know I promised. And that feels and... felt awesome to me because you were seeing how your choices were affecting me. And rather than, um, it felt way better than holding up the agreement and said, no, you don't get to do that because you said this. It felt way better to have you say, oh, hey, so we said we were going to do this, but this changed and I would like to do this different. And I see that it affects you. Yeah. So what do we do now? So another place where this has come up is insects. Okay, when... just for a second, I thought you said insects. And insects. I don't know which insects. 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 Ants, what? Okay, no. <laughs> okay. In insects, our desires and needs change. Desire discrepancy is something I, I face all the time, ev everywhere. I face it in, in client sessions, but I also face it in just conversations with friends. Desire discrepancy, having one partner want more or less sex or more or less or more different or whatever, yeah. having it not be lined up and juicy and yummy all the time is totally typical. No biggie. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like no biggie. Most of the time, desire discrepancy feels pretty out. Right. It feels it brings up feelings of unwantedness, of unworthiness. It can remind us of things from our childhood. It can um, it can feel like a trap because if we want too much, then it's too much or too little. It's too little. There are all these things we put onto sex. Again, another whole conversation. Let's yeah. we will have a further discussion about desire discrepancy. And if you have questions about desire discrepancy, please. Yeah. Feel free to email me, Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'll make sure we answer them anonymously um, on the remember, podcast. You can always ask me too, Ken at JolieHamilton.com. Right. And so when this comes up, having agreements about sex, in order to be consensual, I think most people have gotten to this spot. Let's, let's all get on the same page. You have to always be able to renegotiate because consent has to be ongoing, ongoing. freely given, fully informed. And then we have bodies and hormones and minds and souls that change. Yeah. If you feel entitled to having some of your sexual needs met or all of your sexual needs met through my actions or even harder for me through my desire, like oh, I need to desire yeah. you in a specific way. Oof. Man, you're doing all the right things, but I don't like your attitude. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, that's happened. But, <laughs> okay, well. Um, yeah. So I. But I, yeah, so the in, bringing entitlement can come in really easily on the back of an agreement. Right, but it also comes in really easily in in a topic like sex, where it is pretty typical that people don't talk about their expectations. So mm. agreements are also about expectation setting. When it comes to something like sex, most of us have an, a set of expectations that we have not really made visible to ourselves. And so the expectation is just sitting there, lurking around, allowing us to feel um, like total crap <laughs> really easily, yeah. right? Yeah. My needs can be either unmet or I can become, I can, I can talk myself into like feeling unwantable or cast aside, or I, it is such an easy place to receive a wound. Making an explicit relationship agreement around sex means facing some of these realities that we've left in the shadows, that we've left mm -hmm. to hope that our, our marital agreement or the monogamous culture that we live in or the whatever, yeah. that that will uphold the agreement. Yeah. And, have an and I'll get what I want. Yeah. And 
And so a fun part about all that is an explicit agreement means, uh, okay, so I'm going to ask for this thing I want. And by the way, I don't want anybody to know that I want it. So ideally we wouldn't talk about it, but you'd get it to me anyway. Oof. Okay. Give an example of that. Cause that is. That's going to be hard to come up with right here on the, the spot. So but, um... I'm thinking about, okay, there are. Okay, so something, for example, that I feel shame about, or right. shame about wanting. Right. Um, and some of them are pretty, um, uh, it doesn't really make sense why I would feel shame about them. Yeah, but it doesn't um, matter. Shame doesn't, do, shame does not bother yeah. with making sense. It doesn't need to. Yeah, so there are some very tame sex acts that I have asked for. And I have, I wasn't sure I wanted to completely turn off the explicit, you know, turn on the explicit <laughs> button for this, but um so so what um, if you ask for them what if you ask for an explicit sex act yeah what if the thing you want is to not have to ask for it yeah and that, that's yeah. the thing you want you right. want somebody to read your mind yeah and provide to you the the pleasure if you've really had the chance to reflect on that act that you want, then perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you could ask to not have to ask. Now we're getting deep into okay, the layers of but, what it means to yeah. like tease out uh, mm -hmm. a sexual desire from someone else. Yeah. And that can be a really fun game to play, but even that needs a basis of agreement. Right. Um, I don't know what I want, but I'd like for you to, um, to explore with me and help me figure out how to name this thing I want. But that relies on a lot of, of, um, trust that I can set my boundaries as we go. Yes. That I can, that, that we can renegotiate as we proceed through the experience that we might have. Yep. And for me, it requires me to trust myself. This is, it's way more oh, than yeah, having sure. to trust you. Right. If I'm looking for some sort of sexual agreement, I want to be able to trust myself. And I think that goes actually for all relationship agreements. It's self-trust that's the hardest to manage. Yeah, absolutely. When I put my trust in you, there's something about like locating that control that like giving, giving that to you and saying, boy, you're great. Uphold that all. But mm. to trust myself to make my needs and wants clear to, um, to ask for things and then to do what I have promised I would do and then to renegotiate when so, cause I think one of the hardest change. things about a, an agreement is when I have had to come to you and say, yeah, so I've changed and I hope we can still have a relationship, but I don't know for sure because I have changed and now that means I want the agreement to change. So the thing that gives me strength in those moments is knowing that we prioritize this, this growth model yeah, of relating. Knowing, knowing that's and when I say that, basis. I mean explicitly yes. that we have committed to an individuation oriented relationship. So I know that you in your best self will, will be able to take a step back from, Oh, I don't want my agreement to change or damn it. I was get this was good. Right. <laughs> I don't want it to yeah, change because it was really yummy. But you're relying on me to be accountable to myself about the agreement that I already made. Not about the details, so, but about the growth. Cause there's the thing at the root. We're not talking about an agreement. We're talking about our shared core purpose of our relationship. Oh, yeah. Right. I want to do a follow of that purpose and all these episode ways. about the two key things that I recommend everyone do when they're trying to develop their relational capacity. One is know your why, know why mm -hmm. you're showing up to this party and what your what your personal self wants, and then together create a purpose. When we defined our our relationship's purpose as an individuation container for both of us, it started to be okay to have these conversations that were, um, yeah, large yikes. Like they, they yes. weren't necessarily yeah. going to be about 
oh, how do I, how do I uphold my agreement? But instead, how do I stay flexible in the agreement? How do I move to the next stage? How do I learn to relate to you as you actually are, yeah. as you are changing? Which means I have to, I have to stay flexible in my approach to what, what's going to happen. If I fixate too much, and I'm a person who really loves a five-year plan. <laughs> you do. Heck, I, like, I, love, I love a 50-year plan. But if I stay flexible, then we can renegotiate. And it is the thing that let me tattoo your name on my arm. <laughs> you know, I, the thing <laughs> was that I knew that we could stay flexible. And if the relationship no longer looked like this, and, and because statistics are not on our sides, we're this right. a second marriage. So I think our, our odds are ba maybe like 25% that will make it, that will quote unquote succeed. Yeah. I measure our success by can we gracefully transition yes. through the changes that we're each going to have as we individuate. And the agreement, the conversation that the agreement is helps us gracefully manage right. the transition. And it's founded on this, this shared value, this shared purpose. Because I know what our shared purpose is, when everything feels terrifying and overwhelming, um, or I feel like I've now lost something because you changed the rules mm -hmm. <laughs> or because I'm asking for a change of the rules, I can always come back to, hey, the rules were always in place to simply create a conversation between the two of us. Yeah. They were never meant to curtail our growth. They were never meant to keep things stagnant. They were always meant to allow us to continue to progress through a process. And that means holding central this shared value we have. Every relationship, um, I've had other relationships during, and, and even just recently, I've had relationships that changed and it meant that they ended. There was a, there was an end rather right. than a smooth transition into some other relationship. There they was weren't a resilient. Hard, they weren't flexible. They weren't resilient and flexible. And that's the thing that has been most challenging. I love having a relationship where I have no idea if we will be married a year from now, but I absolutely trust that I can stay flexible to your growth path, path your, your passages through yourself mm -hmm. to allow myself to relate to the new you tomorrow, next month, next year. And that takes some of the pressure off about whether we are meant to be each other's right. romantic partners or sexual partners or even financial partners or parenting partners. I, we can come back to, we, yeah, I'm here to show up and find out who you are. Yeah. The, the trust in, um, in, in the agreement and the, in the mutual goal of growth of individuation says that, so if we're not married a year from now, I trust that it's because it's blocking our growth. Yeah. That that's that the marriage no longer serves that. We're going to be doing something we'll else. Be doing something else. Um, and that is a, a, a pretty peaceful thing. Like There's... in security, that feels like security. <laughs> the ability to navigate security. change. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. self. Capital S self. Yeah. Um, in alignment with my 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 connection to divinity or whatever it is that I imagine is larger than me, that leaves me feeling the safest. Yeah. And it me is. Too. Me too. Our fights used to terrify me because I felt like each one was going to be an ending because I didn't understand the resilience that was possible. And because you were living partially in my system. Yes. You're, you had imagined that your happiness had to do with what I would give you yep. and what I would sacrifice for you. And, and me too. And, and if you were holding me accountable for everything and I wasn't, and you weren't going to be around your whole life, existential panic. Yeah. Yeah. Deepening our, each of our connections to our self, our capital S yep. self is that's the free, that, that is the freest I've ever felt and has let me. So I've experienced two major heartbreaks this summer. Um, and it's okay. They're, they are major heartbreaks and it's okay. I don't have to be defined by what these other people were able to allow in their life. Right. And I can trust myself to be resilient. 
that's the safest I've ever felt in my life. And it allows me to stay with the sensation of I, I'm whole. I am whole unto myself. I am complete. I am not, not looking to complete myself through someone else. I'm looking to, to go for a wander with you and find out what the heck is possible. Uh, right. The, it's the exploration. And, uh, and that goes and for all of the partners I've had. The shared discovery. Yeah. Okay. So this got really deep and existential. So next level of, of relationship agreement conversations, and it's not done. This will be a thread throughout oh, the yeah. podcast. If you yeah. have questions about it, or if you have a specific instance that you'd like to have teased apart and pulled apart and, and see how somebody else looks at it, happy to hear from you, be in touch. And until then, I would love it if each of you simply spent five minutes thinking about what it is you want to hold yourself accountable to. What's mm. at the core of what you want out of relating? And just make yourself visible to yourself. Until next time. See Thanks ya. for listening. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.